Okay, but and then uh, we will add it. Uh, we will um, cut afterwards the things. And do you know when it's going to come out uh, in Italian? No, I don't. I don't. No. Okay. I would guess relatively soon. Okay, and it's how to blow a pipeline. How to blow up a pipeline, yes. Yes, just let me write it down so that I can announce that too. Lear and the subtitle is Learning to Fight the World on Fire. Okay, so uh, you will tell me that again, how to blow a it Yes, learning to, fight, learning to fight and a world on fire. I think, I think that, that book is actually more relevant for the climate movement because it's all about tactics for the climate movement. But, uh, okay, in, in a world on fire. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, if you agree, I think we can start. And Salvo, oh. should I mute my mic? and uh, keep down my no, camera. No, no. no the camera is okay, not a knew. problem. Uh, the microphone uh, is better. It's in the, when you, uh, Okay. So, um, we are here with Andreas Mann. And first of all, let me thank him for uh, being here with us uh, to discuss you. a few issues about um, climate and climate change climate justice, coronavirus. Um, starting from the fact that Andreas has a book coming out in the summer for Verso titled Corona Climate Chronic Emergency, War Communism in the 21st Century. And so some of our questions will be uh, addressed by Andreas based on uh, uh, the material which will be released soon. But let me just say that uh, uh, Andreas has another book coming out, uh, also from Verso, I suppose, in the English edition, but there will be an Italian translation uh, almost immediately after it is released in English. And the second book is titled How to Blow a Pipeline, Learning to Fight in a World on Fire. And it's mostly about tactics, uh, which will prove uh, quite useful, I suppose, for climate justice uh, movements. Um, but also Andreas has published uh, other two very relevant books for um, our concerns. Uh, the first one is Fossil Capital and the second one is The Progress of This Storm. So uh, I have presented our uh, guest and now I will start with the first uh, question if you agree, Andreas. Yeah. And so basically uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion uh, on the relationship between uh, COVID-19 and the climate uh, crisis. And in your book, you basically say, well, the comparison is a, is a mistake because it's more or less like comparing a war uh, to a bullet, but at the same time, the two processes are interlaced and they should be seen as belonging to a, a similar tendency and they should be addressed together. So I would like to ask you, first of all, if you can unpack your, your view about this uh, issue. Yeah, sure. Uh, let, me, let me just say that from our perspective as in the climate movement, the, this pandemic has been a, a tremendous disaster politically because our movement had its peak historically so far last year and actions and so on and so forth and then, and then just all of a sudden everything was cancelled and had to be uh, put on hold because of this pandemic and our, our movement has been frozen and paralyzed and I think we haven't yet found a way to uh, replace our activism on the streets with any kind of digital activism that can fill that void uh, but one of the one of the problems here is that the COVID-19 pandemic has been received as a bolt from the blue, as a, you know, a sudden, uh, random disaster without any deeper drivers or, or political causes, uh, almost like an asteroid hitting the earth and it's just uh, bam, here it is and we just have to cope with it and survive. Uh, but the argument I tried to make, and that of course is, is based on, on research that 
others have done and arguments that others have put forth is that we really should see this pandemic as part of the ecological crisis. So the, the error in, uh, in comparing COVID-19 as such with the climate crisis is that COVID-19 is a, a, a single event that manifests um, a much deeper trend, which is the rise of zoonotic spillover or you know, these new infectious diseases that spill over from animals to humans. And this is a, a, a rising trend of new diseases of this kind that has been going on for a number of years and all indications are that this trend will continue. So we'll see more of those diseases. So in that sense, uh, um, th this trend it runs parallel to the trend of rising temperatures. So we have a rise in, in emerging infectious diseases and a rise in global temperatures. And these are two facets or aspects of the ecological crisis. You, if you want to be a little bit vulgar, as I am at one point in the book, you can, you can see, as, see it as global sickening and global heating. And they go together. And they can, of course, be compared, and they are interlinked in various ways. And uh, just to say, uh, just to pick out one link, the main driver of this trend to new diseases spilling over from animals is deforestation. Because you have naturally pathogens that circulate in wild nature and primarily in tropical forests. Uh, and when you cut those forests down and you, you build roads into them and you build plantations where those forests usually were, you open what's called interfaces where you come in, the human economy come into contact with those pathogens and they start to spill over from animals into, uh, into human populations. And deforest so deforestation is the main general driver of this trend to more diseases of this kind. And it's also, as we know, the second most important driver of the climate crisis. Uh, the, the most important, of course, being fossil fuel combustion. Uh, when, when pathogens have spilled over into human populations, they can spread and create pandemics if there is some kind of transportation system that can transmit those pathogens and those infections quickly enough. And uh, the way this works, and this has been the case with, with all the three coronavirus epidemics that we've seen so far in this century, the SARS, the MERS, and the SARS-2, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The way this works is that you have mass aviation spreading the, the diseases rapidly across the world and turning them into pandemics. And mass aviation is also a climate problem. These are just some of the links. There are many others as well. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, the, this, the, the enormous challenge for the climate movement in this situation is to try to explain to people that the disaster we're struggling with right now is not, not just some random astronomic inexplicable misfortune, but it's actually part of the fundamental problems of how our societies relate to nature. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just something that we're going to see again and again and again if we continue to destroy wild nature uh, as we're doing right now. So the, the, the struggle for the climate movement is to draw the links and connect the dots between our old concerns and uh, this uh, acute disaster situation. Thanks a lot, Andres. I couldn't uh, agree more. And actually, all the webinars we have organized uh, as a political, uh, the political um, ecology scene uh, in Italy have tried, has tried to actually do this connecting uh, activity. Well, we don't know if we succeeded, but it, clearly the explanation is um, a deep one. Wonderful. And so thank you for this, uh, um, for this um, reply. Uh, second question. I uh, was very happy to see, like in the in the book, like midway through uh, the manuscript, uh, you define. You say this crisis might be defined defined as the first true O'Connor crisis, like you know, referring to um, eco-Marxist uh, James O'Connor who passed away 
couple of years ago. And uh, just to say that um, with um, publisher Ombre Corte here in Italy, and Ombre Corte is uh, uh, very much involved right now in the political ecology scene, uh, we are thinking of republishing the, the book, The Second Contradiction uh, of Capital. So I, I was actually surprised in a very positive way. So my second question would be, can you explain a little bit uh, more what you mean by the first true O'Connor crisis about this pandemic? Yes. So uh, it looks like this coronavirus has triggered a capitalist crisis, a strictly economic crisis that is at least on the size of the financial crisis in 2008 and maybe much worse. I mean, there, there, so far, uh, quite a few experts in this field have said that this, this economic crisis, this recession, or rather almost, you know, collapse of, of the is of normal capitalist growth is worse than maybe anything that has been seen in modern times. So the Bank of England, for instance, said uh, some some a few few weeks back that this looks like it's going to be the worst crisis that we've seen in sen in a century or even in several centuries. Now we don't we don't know where this will end. No one knows if now that that economies start opening up, if there will be a rebound uh, and and will return to some more normal growth in the second part of this year we, we don't know or if it will spiral on into a much deeper economic crisis that you know drives itself towards some uh, some some very serious and long-lasting depression we don't know but clearly there is an economic crisis and if we accept that zoonotic spillover is an ecological process and problem we face the situation where we have a, a strictly capitalist crisis induced by an ecological factor. And I think we have never seen that before in such an evident way. It's hard to make the case that the financial crisis in 2008 was directly caused by an ecological event or a, a part of the ecological crisis. Likewise with the, the uh, various financial crises that, and crashes that we saw in the 90s, the East Asian crash, for instance, in 97. Or if you go further back in capitalist history, the, the major crisis in 1973 or the one in 1929. Uh, neither of those would seem to fit this model where you have an, an ecological crisis event triggering uh, a capitalist economic crisis. So this, may, this seems to make this, this particular crisis unique in capitalist history. And as far as I'm aware, there's only one Marxist crisis theorist, theorist that has tried to theorize precisely this type of crisis, and that's James O'Connor, who argued that uh, there are two possibilities for capitalism, two, two tracks or two pathways into capitalist crisis. One is the uh, inherent contradictions in capital accumulation that often lead to things like overproduction, overaccumulation, or it, it, today we could also say very, various types of financial crisis. On the other hand, capitalism also has a tendency to destroy the natural conditions for capital accumulation. So it has a tendency to, uh, to exhaust and deplete labor power and nature as such and this can can at some point uh, curve back on capital uh, as in a ricochet or, or a boomerang that strikes back on capital and creates serious problems in uh, the production of profit and uh, uh, this what's been happening during this pandemic seems to fit that model in that we've had a, a, a a crisis induced by zoonotic spillover that then threatens the physical integrity and reproduction of uh, labor power and of consumers so that one of the natural conditions of capital accumulation namely a, a reasonably healthy population is under threat and then states have intervened to try to protect this condition and keep the population reasonably healthy but while doing so and protecting this condition, it has had to interfere so deeply in the normal processes of capital accumulation 
that uh, a very serious crisis, capitalist crisis, has resolved. So, you know, as you've had in Italy, most uh, normal commodity production suspended and consumption uh, closed for, for months. We've never seen anything like this. Uh, and the, the purpose of this, as enforced by the state, is precisely to make sure that the population doesn't die in, in too uh, big numbers. Uh, and I think, I think this, well, it seems to me that this fits pretty well and su almost surprisingly well with James O'Connor's model for the second contradiction. Agreed. Agreed. I would say it's a long way coming from uh, 1973, but I, I really hope uh, we meet uh, the next historical materialism conference to actually go through the details of this hypothesis you advance, which I find very, very interesting. So I come to my last um, question, which is this. Uh, by the end of your, uh, of your book, you basically propose a political uh, framework to organize, you know, to struggle within what you call chronic uh, emergency. And you call that uh, ecological Leninism. So I was kind of intrigued by the definition and I would ask you to describe a little bit to us uh, the main features of this political strategy. Yeah, so, I, I mean, this is a little bit of an in, uh, intentional provocation, but uh, the, the idea here is worked out in a, in a kind of, a, how shall I put it, critical dialogue with other uh, currents in the uh, socialist tradition. So the, the general argument, of course, is that these crises that we're seeing in this chronic emergency are essentially, to put it crudely, products of capitalism. So if we're going to deal with these crises and their drivers, we will have to uh, deploy some kind of anti-capitalist measures. That doesn't necessarily mean that to solve this crisis, we, by definition, have to create a completely socialist society tomorrow. But because the drivers of these crises represent uh, very powerful interests among the dominant classes, we will never be able to address those drivers without also ch challenging those dominant classes. And that entails a kind of anti-capitalist edge of any kind of serious policy to mitigate those crises. So what can the socialist tradition uh, inspire in this situation? Well, there is of course social democracy, here understood as the, the classical reformist project of gradually extracting reforms step by step from uh, uh, the dominant classes and making society slowly more equal. And that uh, worked uh, reasonably well in Sweden, for instance, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. But this whole project is based on having a lot of time at your disposal because the process is supposed to be gradual and pretty slow. So uh, social democracy has no conception of catastrophe and emergency. Indeed, the, 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 the genesis of reformist social democracy in, in Germany, in the debate between Bernstein and Luxembourg, was all about saying that uh, we are not facing any catastrophic crisis anymore in capitalism. We're, we're looking toward, this was Bernstein's argument, we're looking to a period of stable, slow growth where we can slowly, gradually build up our strength. That's not the situation in this chronic emergency. We are facing catastrophes. So uh, that means I think that uh, classical social democracy doesn't really work as a political project in this period, which is not to say that actual social democratic formations as in the British Labour Party or I don't know, the, the DSA in the US or what have you uh, are, are useless. To the contrary, they might be the, the, the most promising political formations that we have. But if they were to come into power, as they could have done recently with Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders, they would have had to go beyond uh, classical reformist slow gradually if they were to deal with, with the drivers of this crisis. So social democracy doesn't seem to be the most promising way forward. Another alternative is anarchism, which uh, as a general political current, vague in its contours, has become popular in the past decades in social movements, including, including the climate movement, for understandable reasons. 
as a reaction to, uh, to, to, Stalinist, to the Stalinist experience. But I don't see how we can even think of the kind of measures needed to address the drivers of this chronic emergency without the state. I don't see how we, we could even imagine uh, cutting emissions by 8% per year, for instance, without seeing the state doing it. Uh, and the kind of, of state interventions that we've seen in the past half year, uh, which has been all about treating a symptom of the ecological crisis, uh, mutating into dealing instead with the drivers of the crisis. So uh, some, of the, some of the more concrete demands that I throw, up, uh, throw out in the book, such as uh, nationalizing fossil fuel companies, taking them over and turning them into uh, organizations for instead drawing down CO2 out of the atmosphere, or uh, trying to uh, completely abolish wildlife trade, or addressing the problem of our supply chains and trade flows and imports into Europe causing deforestation. I don't see that anyone else could do that than the state. Now, the state is not, the states as we are seeing them today in Europe and, and, and elsewhere, advanced capitalist states are not obviously going to do this of their own accord, of their own initiative. So they would have to be forced to push to do it by pressure from below. But uh, the, the idea of ecological Leninism then would be to, uh, to accept that we need emergency action and that the state will have to do it. But the core of, of the idea of ecological Leninism, I, I would say, is precisely to try to turn the crisis that we face more and more frequently, which are crisis of symptoms. So wildfires in Australia or the current extreme crisis of the locusts in East Africa, now compounded by floods, or COVID-19, these are all, uh, these all manifest symptoms of the ecological crisis. Uh, what Lenin did when, when the First World War broke out as the boom, the, ma the, you know, the major catastrophe of, of the early 20th century that broke the stability of the long 19th century, is that he and others, of course, Rosa Luxemburg prominently and, and others, said that we have to turn this crisis into a crisis for the drivers of war. And for them, that was, of course, capitalism in its imperialist stage. So, and that, that was the, the essential Leninist gesture or, or, or uh, yeah, strategic move of, of the period of the First World War to, to transform the, the, the crisis of symptoms into a, a crisis where you actually instead target the, the underlying drivers of these problems. And it's precisely this move that we in the climate movement have to make and try to make in the years ahead when we'll face more and more uh, climate disasters and other kinds of impacts of the ecological crisis to use these uh, opportunities uh, use these as political opportunities to, to target the underlying drivers, or else we'll just face a rising tide of catastrophes that you know, will go on forever and that will eventually kill us all. Uh, so, I mean, the, this is the, the, I would say that this is the, the core of, the, of my little idea of ecological Leninism, but I, the, of course, the, the limit of the, of the metaphor, if you like, of ecological Leninism is that I'm obviously not proposing that we should have a, a dictatorship of the proletariat or, or of the party or you know, destroying our, uh, our current state apparatuses and replacing them with something completely different. Uh, but we should be open for, you know, when we have those very intense crises as we've had this year and that as we can expect that we'll have more of in the coming years because the fundamental ecological crisis is so deep, we'll see more of this happening, then you, you can also expect profound political volatility and unexpected things will happen. And I don't think in December that anyone would have expected 
by any stretch of the imagination that we would have seen this deep political, you know, state interventions into how markets operate that we've seen the, the, in these months. So, uh, and that, that's another uh, key feature of Leninist politics as understood in, in the tradition that I come from, that uh, you have to be prepared for sudden uh, ruptures and shifts in the balance of forces and try to intervene in those moments and uh, put, uh, don't be afraid of, uh, uh, not being afraid of using the state as an instrument to uh, uh, attack the drivers of those crises, but uh, instead uh, uh, be prepared to put all the pressure on the states to do precisely this. Yeah, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, that, that was very clear. I'm sure there will be plenty of debates um, yeah. in our circles, and uh, that's precisely, I suppose, what writing a book means uh, on your part and on my part uh, as a reader uh, to read it. So uh, the interview basically is uh, over. Thank you so much, Andreas, for your time and Thank for you, writing um, all this. Can Please, I just can, just can I just end with something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean. So last year was an incredible year for us in the climate movement. And one of the most inspiring things was to see the climate movement sort of explode in Italy. That, at least that's the impression that I had from, from Sweden. So it's a correct had, one. Yeah, you had very big climate strikes yep. uh, and the, the climate camp in Venice. And this seemed to be really, boom, uh, very, a very sudden and rapid expansion of the movement. In Germany, for instance, it's, it's been going on for, for a longer time, but it seemed like in Italy you, you just managed to mobilize very many people very quickly. And that was extremely hopeful uh, 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 and inspiring. And I hope that you and others, of course, in the movement, when, when the situation eases, can regain that, that wonderful momentum and uh, we can uh, get back on track to where we were when this shit began. Thank you so much. We hope uh, the same and we are doing all we can to actually use this time. We cannot uh, actually be physically close to yes. study, to improve, to learn more, to be more prepared as you yes. said. So let's hope we are lucky because we need luck, but not just luck. So we'll do our best, uh, Andres, and thank you again. Thank you so much. For thank being you. with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, wait for you. Yeah, 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 I would love yeah. to. Yes, yes. Thanks it will so happen. Much. Keep up the thank great you. work. Keep up you the great too. work. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.